We are recording. Um, so hey, everybody, welcome to 1559 Implementers meeting number six. I just shared the agenda in the chat. A uh, couple of people joined in since, so let me reshare it just in case. Um, so first thing on the agenda was just uh, client updates on, on the testnet. Uh, maybe we can start with Nethermind. I know, uh, Thomas, you just posted an update on, on the Discord. Yeah, sure. So we're fully synced with validating blocks. Uh, so Abdul Hamid mentioned that there is some, some problem with filling the blocks, I believe, at the moment. Uh, the, the issue with synchronization that we've seen last week, so when I looked at it, it was a very small thing. So I, I love the code that was comparing the available block space for uh, both the old style transactions and the new style transactions. And since we merged them together in the transaction pool and in the blocks, it was no longer important. So when the old style transactions appeared, um, we treated them as uh, beyond the space in the block for them and we rejected the block. But after removing that code that checks, it's all fine. Cool. Um, yeah, Abdel, do you want to give an update on the base side? Uh, yeah, uh, so nothing really new on the core Ethereum client, except uh, some new fields added to some RPC endpoint, uh, like, like the get block by number and get block by hash endpoints to uh, basically return the base fee. So uh, corresponding to the three EIP I wrote about uh, adding the E1559 uh, fields uh, to the existing uh, RPC endpoint, for example, for uh, endpoints that return, return uh, block fields. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, we are working on the tooling, but we have a specific item on the ad agenda about that. So I'll we'll talk about that later. Cool. And uh, Rick or Ramil, do you want to get an update from the get side? Yeah, I can uh, provide updates. So we completed update um, Yes, code to um, be aligned with latest version of EIP. Uh, and also we tested synchronization guest to guest and guest to BSU and it works well. And uh, now we are working on testing guest to nevermind. Got it. Um, and when you say test, you ran your local network or have you been syncing on the network that, uh, that we've been using with Leathermind? Uh, no, it's a, a local network. Okay, got it. Um, I, I, yeah, I would suggest to skip that step and test directly uh, on the testnet because be we are in sync with Netamine. So if you that works with Bezos, that should also work with Netamine. But uh, it's up to you. Just mm -hmm. saying. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have questions about test network. Uh, how can I? Uh, join to that uh, can i get okay, uh, okay so we can talk about that later because i okay. have a point, point about that during mm -hmm. the demo okay. yeah yeah sure uh, okay if i can um, miss one, one important thing is that yeah. uh, most likely you'll have uh, a person joining on the uh, research press development side uh, part-time uh, specifically uh, involved with EIP one five five nine only for another mind. So nice. that's uh, most likely is happening uh, next week. That's that's really good news. Um. Cool. So yeah, I guess this is kind of from the client side. Um, maybe it makes sense. Uh, I know Barnaby, you had a new notebook as well that you released uh, this week or last week. I forget. Uh, do you want to give a quick update on on that before we dig? more into the testnet stuff? Uh, sure, whatever you prefer. I can do it after the testnet as well. But... I guess I'm just concerned we end up getting bogged down in the testnet and we don't have time. Uh, okay. So, yeah. Um, yeah, is it? Wait, so first, so I released this new notebook which looks at the combination between 1559 and the escalator. So this idea that you can have 1559 to have like a nice default market price for the transaction. And meanwhile, users can use this kind of incremental bid strategy to, to increase their bids over time. Uh, 
Uh, let me just post the link here. Right. Um, should I share my screen? Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Let's do that. Right. So in one of my previous notebook, I kind of show that um, whenever demand is shifting quite fast and increasing, uh, users have the incentive to become strategic and to kind of try and overbid each other, which is what we see currently in this uh, first price auction uh, mechanism that we, we currently live in. And so this idea of the escalator was coming to say, well, many people are doing this resubmission pattern on the wallet. So you send a transaction and you resend it, you bump your, your gas price a little bit to hope that now you are more competitive. And the idea of the escalator is to take that pattern and put it in the protocol and allow you to decide on how low your bid is starting from and how high you are willing your bid to go. And over time, your bid is just increasing uh, between these two, these two bounds. And it's kind of a neat idea, but the main, let's say, problem was that it has a lot of parameters. Like you have to decide your start bid, you have to decide how high you're willing to go, you have to decide how fast you want to go as well. Um, and the nice thing about 1559 is that we actually get kind of this default price, which is you're being quoted this uh, entry price to the transaction gas market. So, so the idea of combining the two is to at least remove at one parameter, which is how high you should start your bid. Like you should start it at what the base fee is currently. And then uh, in this notebook, I was trying to investigate, let's say, different strategies. So I look at two strategies. First, maybe I'll show like, okay, this picture kind of shows you in blue here, you have a base fee, which is moving around. So here you assume that it's increasing maybe because the demand is increasing and you have two players like Alice and Bob. And Alice is kind of in a more of a hurry than Bob is. So she would set the, her bid to ramp faster than Bob does. And so what happens with this mechanism is you kind of track the base fee. So your bid looks like is varying the way the base fee is. But over time, you you keep adding a bit more to your bid. And you keep saying, hey, miner, my bid is getting higher and higher. So now maybe you want to include me. And so that's that's that may be helpful uh, in these cases where the demand is, is increasing and users would rather try and compete against each other uh, rather than take the, the base fee as a, as a market price. So really like the escalator is, it's, it's more expressive than p plain vanilla 1559 is. Uh, but the question is, do we care about this expressiveness at all? Like what do we gain from having this more expressive bidding language? And so what I try to introduce in the notebook is this idea of efficiency, which is how uh, we look at, let's say, the performance of a mechanism in, uh, in game theory. Uh, so we really care that users which have very high value for their transactions go in first, or at least or go in uh, as fast as possible. And so I'm looking at these two different strategies. So this one is a strategy where uh, I have, let's say, very high costs. I, I don't want to wait. I'm trying to arbitrage this uh, transaction and so I want to get in as fast as possible. So I look at how much costs I have to for waiting and I set my escalator to ramp about as fast as my cost is. So the more it pains me to wait, the, the faster I'll get my escalator to, to increase. And maybe I'll let you like read through it. I'm also planning to release videos and I haven't gotten around to it, but I think it'd be, it'd be nice to have uh, a bit of an audio description as well. Uh, all right, no, I don't want to get into this. But the second strategy sort of uh, encodes a different behavior, which is sometimes I don't really care that my transaction goes in as fast as possible. I just want it to go in at some point. So I'll just tell myself, okay, I'm willing to wait for 10 blocks and I'll keep increasing my bid, escalate my bid over time until these 10 blocks are done. And hopefully I get in by, by, the, time these, uh, by the time of these 10 blocks. And so the interesting thing is that when the users in your transaction market use these different strategies, uh, you really see like different, let's say, behavior of the market as a whole. So even visually, 
uh, not going to go into the, the details, but uh, visually you see that it, it's kind of very different. I, I picture users as dots and the color of the dots is the wave of users that are progressively coming in. Uh, and I think it's, it kind of gives some intuition. It's definitely like an introductory work because there's a lot more work to do on, let's say, figuring out these strategies. Uh, in game theory, we like to know that, okay, is this an equilibrium or not? Like, what should I do as a user? What is my best strategy? So yeah, this is kind of still uh, on the roadmap to figure out uh, something I actually hope to do with a team here in Singapore. Uh, so yeah, maybe more detail on this uh, at a later point, but read, read through it and, and let me know if you have like any questions or thoughts or if it's helpful at all. Thanks. Um, does anyone on the call have any thoughts, questions? Okay. Um, in that case, maybe Abdel, it makes sense for you to take also a couple of minutes to walk through some of the tooling you've been working on. Yep, sure. Uh, so to give a bit of uh, background, so uh, we can see that uh, this EIP introduces a lot of working changes uh, in terms of UX and uh, all of those stuff uh, with the new block header field and the new transaction fields. So that impacts uh, wallet providers, uh, block explorers, uh, so almost all the, the chain. Uh, so we decided to implement some tooling around E1559 to make it easier for users to, to interact with the testnet, also for client implementers that will join uh, after, uh, that will be easier for them to, to do to, to do their implementation and to validate it. So yeah, I will show you some of the tooling. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay. So first we have a standalone component that has a REST API. Uh, so we have a open API documentation. So this is pretty standard documentation. So we have some uh, RPC, uh, not RPC. So we have some REST APIs to to basically submit transaction uh, using legacy style or the new format uh, style. And uh, yeah, another thing is uh, uh, likely we will have to change uh, the format of the transaction again when we will use the type transaction envelope. So if we al already have this tooling, we will change only one tool and that will be profitable for everyone. So yeah, uh, some API to play with transactions and some API to uh, basically retrieve uh, the base fee because uh, this is not uh, yet integrated in the current RPC endpoint. So you can try directly using this uh, interface. Uh, yeah, I have to choose the right endpoint. And yeah, you can get the base fee. So if you don't specify the block number, it retrieves the latest fee the base fee of the latest block, and uh, you can uh, get the base fee for uh, at a given block. Here it is. And uh, yeah, so this is a, a standalone HTTP service. And on top of that, we also uh, built a web interface to make it even easier for users to play with it. So yeah, obviously there is an issue there because you have to specify the private key because uh, MetaMask and all uh, other wallet providers don't uh, have the new format transaction. So uh, I'm planning to add the whitelist mechanism to accept only uh, private keys from the genesis. And this is already what I do in the, the web interface. For example, you can choose among uh, a list of accounts that is loaded directly from uh, the genesis. So uh, the UI provides some links to the specification, work updates, uh, also, we have a block explorer for the testnet and uh, network status. So we can see the three Bezo nodes and the NetaMine nodes. So if anyone, uh, uh, if anyone needs uh, the credentials for the EdStat, let us know in the Discord channel. Uh, and we, are, we started also to write uh, a wiki guide, uh, basically to join the testnet. So this is why I'm gathering information from Netamine and Get as well about the branches to use. I would need also the Genesis file and uh, the configuration file and the scripts to, to launch the different uh, clients. So if you need the Genesis, you can click 
there and you will have the Bezo Genesis. Uh, that will be great if you could provide me the Netamine Genesis and the Get Genesis as well. Uh, same for the CLI option or config file will be even better. And yeah, basically, uh, let's do a quick demo. So you can specify all the transaction fields. So I'm in legacy mode, so I have only the already existing fields. I can set auto non, so it will retrieve the, the nonce using the add transaction count endpoint. Uh, I can show the recipient, the value, uh, the unit, gas limit and gas price. So this will be a legacy uh, transaction that will be automatically converted to uh, an E1559 transaction. So you have the link to the explorer. So the transaction has not been mined. Here it is. So you can see the information of the transaction. So we have not updated yet the, uh, the explorer to integrate the E1559 fields. So this is why you can see the gas price set to zero. And uh, yeah, if I switch to 1559, I can I can see two uh, new fields and the gas price uh, is not available anymore. So the minor bribe and the fee cap. So the minor bribe will be added on top of the base fee. Uh, I have a helper button estimate that basically take, uh, it, it sets the, the minor bribe to one way, uh, the value uh, is configurable for the settings. And it also adds a, a margin on top of that. And also it retrieves the latest bus fee. And there is an addition uh, with the, all those three things to have a working fee cap. So obviously you can play with different settings, but this is just to have a, uh, yeah, an easy to, to do settings. And basically, you can submit the E1559 transaction <clears throat> the same way. OK, it has been mined. And uh, yeah, that's it. And about the tooling, we also have uh, a tool that basically stress tests the network and uh, try to fill blocks. So uh, let me show you one block, for example, that have been created 20 minutes ago. Uh, there is. Uh, nearly 2000 transaction with in this, in that block for uh, gas uh, gas used uh, near 40 million so we almost reached the uh, the maximum block elasticity so yeah and this tool uh, is a command line tool so all those tools are open source and uh, yeah i will provide the links uh, of the repositories uh, in the discord channel and yeah, that's pretty much it. Cool. Thank you for the demo. Any other thoughts, comments on, on it? OK. Uh, oh, sorry. I say it's really cool. Great job. <laughs> Thanks. Sweet. So I guess uh, the next kind of big thing to figure out is what are the next steps for the test nets. Um, so it seems like we have, uh, you know, basically a nethermine kind of 95% there, geth and 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 basu seems like it's pretty much there, and we still need to see what geth and nethermine. Um, how much more time do you, people think we need to spend on the POA network, um, and then? Is it worth starting to look at proof of work in parallel? Um, what do people feel is like the best next step here? It'd be nice to agree on if we're going to do 2718 or not. So we can get that in mind. Okay. Yeah, maybe we can start there. My, I guess, opinion on 2718 is I would implement it once it's actually kind of scheduled for a hard fork block on mainnet. I'm just scared that like, I don't know, it gets pulled out at the last minute or kind of changed or whatnot. Um, so even if it even if it's not scheduled with 2930, then it will be scheduled with 1559, I believe. Like I think the, the plan is, is 2718 will go out with the next new transaction type, whatever that is. 
if that's not 2930 in Berlin, then 1559 is a good candidate for the next. I don't believe anyone really wants to release a new transaction type without it. That's the impression I've gotten, at least. I guess my, yeah, my only concern is it feels like it's not really a blocker to add 2718 support, right? Like we know we can do it and it's pretty straightforward and, you know, we, there's no kind of huge rush to do it as well because, um, you know, 15, 15 yes, it's, def it's, it's, it's not a long poll, certainly. Um, it's just one of those yeah. things that needs to be done sometime before 1559 launches. Yeah. And if we are waiting for someone to implement, uh, like, if we wait to do 15 or 2718 until later, then it means Open Ethereum and Geth have to implement something and then change it. Whereas may maybe it will encourage them to implement if they're implementing a more complete spec. Which one of the problems that we're, I know we're having is trying to get other people to implement. Uh, yeah. Just and a I thought, think, like that yeah. maybe that's contributing to their hesitancy. Yeah, I think Open Ethereum, my hunch is they probably won't implement anything until it's actually scheduled for mainnet. Uh, Turbo Get said that they don't really have an issue with implementing 1559, but they're just not in a rush to do so. Um, so I, I personally would be a bit biased towards trying to test proof of work before just to make sure that there's no actual issues there. But yeah, I'm curious, I don't know, uh, Thomas and, and Rick, do you have any strong opinions on that? My opinion's not very strong, but... Um... My preference would be to implement uh, 2718. Is that what it is? 27. Yeah. yeah. To implement yeah. it sooner rather than later. Um, okay. I just don't see any. Uh, I mean, the work has to get done either way. And I think I'm not entirely clear what is where the total roadmap is, frankly. So once we. So I do believe the plan is to move to the single transaction type. And and um, and once we've done that, there's no two pools anymore. There's just one transaction type. Once that's done, is there anything else that needs to really be done? I mean, besides the enormous amount of testing? Yeah, no, I think, I think 2718 is the last kind of major spec change. Like... Um, and after that, yeah, I, I think it's testing both proof of work and um, just like dealing with a large state, which is something we're starting to do on the base U side. Um, but I, yeah, I think in terms of like big changes to the the actual EAP itself, 2718 would be the last one. I'm sorry, when you said large state, you mean just the fact that the blocks are bigger, so there's more state? No, so one thing uh, we're trying to work on at BaseU is to see the performance impact of 1559 on a network that has kind of a state comparable with mainnet. So we're going to start building, you know, just local test nets at first to have, you know, 10,000 accounts, then 100,000, a million and whatnot, and see if there's any like major performance impact of 1559 uh, on those. Uh, but that is something we can do in parallel and it'll probably take a couple of weeks at least to get uh, going. Okay. So two, two questions from me. One, uh, Rick was suggesting uh, two pools, and we already have one pool on me on EIP 1559, and like uh, there is no need for uh, for introducing two pools because the two transaction types they very nicely um, convert yeah, one yeah, to the other. Yeah, I was saying that it's we're already at one pool. That's okay, what I was great. That was the yeah, last the... major change I was aware of, but it's already been done. Sorry, then I misunderstood you, uh, team. They you say to to check the state size how would tip 1559 even affect the state is there like it doesn't really change the behavior of the existing system so there is it feels like okay yeah. i understand that there no. are blocks i just might be bigger but it's only temporary so. go ahead Abdel. You're gonna say something? yeah i just wanted to say uh, this is because uh, people are, are uh, already worried about uh, the actual uh, state and the pace it goes up and effectively uh, 1559 won't uh, uh, because of the block elasticity some people are worried about the negative impact it can have uh, yeah yeah but how, how can you how can you just i mean what, what's there to compare like between the ip1559 and the existing state it's just the state will be growing Potentially, like I think 10% faster, but it's only temporary. 
I believe the fear is there's some there's some super super linear um, issue with gas per block, mm. and a single block that is twice as big, when interacting with a large state network like mainnet, could have super linear costs that are not. Yeah, that's ex like, that's exactly it. So I think if we can at least run this, you know, have a test net which has a uh, hundred million accounts and a smart contract with a hundred million storage slots. We can run it both on 1559 and not, and just see, you know, is anything kind of much worse under the 1559 case where the blocks are twice as big? Um, I really, really, the test we need could be done without 1559, just having a 40, uh, 40 million gas block against a large state network. Yeah, like you could yeah. simply fork off a mainnet, set the block gas yeah. limit to 40 million, and then fill a bunch of blocks and see if anything crashes. I think yeah. it's what. Is desired yeah. here. So, team, instead maybe instead of uh, faking this network, big network, let's let's just fork mainnet, and that will be better test and faster achievement of just we'll just fork mainnet uh, for private testing. We've uh, we'll, we can use any accounts that we want uh, to create. Just disable signature here. checking. Yeah. yeah. It Go ahead, Abdel. Uh, it will be harder to have uh, accounts with a uh, large value of it. If... Not really, though. You can add that in the hard fork, right? Ah, okay. Yeah. Fork. Okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. I mean, you, you um, can just disable signature tracking, and then you could use any account you wanted. Um, yeah. If, as part of the fork, that way you could test with any account that has any arbitrary real-world situation going on. There is nothing like signature checking. It's just the extraction of the address. So this is a bit harder yeah, to do. Fair. I think so just, you just, just have, have the signature like the, you just have the R value is just treated as an address. So you just say whatever the R value is, use that address. Like just as part of the fork, if one wanted. Could be. Yeah. But, then, but then the format of transaction is different. So, so it seems like a bit more work. Yeah, then just okay, adding your fair. list of accounts, like adding your list of whales basically as part of the hard fork. Yeah, this seems super simple. That's, that's what I say. This seems simple, and the other one is it's requiring new transaction format, which. Yeah. And be. I guess, I assume we can also change that in a hard fork, but we could change the hash rate as well, right? Like just lower the hash rate back down to basically zero. Yeah, you want to set the difficulty to zero, so that way yeah. you can mine on your three yeah, difficulty, laptops. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, just as a slight side note, uh, in general, I think that this being able to fork mainnet and test would be very use, useful for many people in many situations. Um, so if you guys do do this, um, add this feature into your clients, um, it'd be awesome if you kind of formalize it at least a little bit, just so like someone can use like a config file that does this in the future. Um, I know I've wanted it many times in the past during testing. You can share the net mind uh, chain spec for such a chain and then you can sync to it. So if we if we launch a public testnet on it, then people will be able to start testing it. That will be great, actually, because so practically everyone who has the uh, mainnet mainnet if can just use a different chain ID for signing transaction and start experimenting on it. Yeah, uh, you're saying there's existing tools like that, Rick? Yeah, like uh, Hard Hat apparently claims to do that. Um, I haven't tested it. Oh, nice. Uh, it used to be called Builder, but now it's called Hard Hat. Um, apparently, it will fork from mainnet. Awesome. Yeah, if I'll you can share a link to that, Rick, in the in the Discord, that would be great. Yeah, yeah, give me a sec. Thanks. Um, yeah, so this, I guess, just from a testnet perspective, does it make sense then to go from this proof of authority test that we have now to that like fork of mainnet? Do we want like a smaller proof of work testnet in between, or? Should we go just a forking mainnet? Let's go to mainnet. Anyone feel like we shouldn't do that? <laughs> Test and prod, basically. No, no, yeah. mainnet, mainnet yeah. policy. Yeah, yeah so and I guess if we, get a, <laughs> if we get a thousand bugs uh, forking mainnet, maybe we can try something easier. Um, I think it will be very useful for the future as well, just like uh, mainnet forking for testing different EIPs. And like imagine yeah. for every single EIP, we'll be able to create a separate fork and people will be able to use their accounts that they are used to, to check if their contracts work fine. 
yeah, I think that's a, that's a good idea. Um, so then, okay, so I think it's still worth kind of just ironing out the details on the proof of authority testnet to make sure we're actually all kind of compatible with each other. Um, should we implement 2718 before we fork mainnet? So like when we do the fork of mainnet, should that be a new version of the 1559 spec? I would prefer not to. Okay, so just go to mainnet ASAP. Yeah, same. Okay, and then once we've once we've forked mainnet and we see that it you know generally works, um, then then we can add the change for twenty seven eighteen, right? Yeah, we plan to have it for twenty nine thirty pretty soon. So I think there won't be big time difference, but just yeah. wouldn't like to say that we have to have twenty seven eighteen to just do the fork of this uh, test. I mean, okay. Yeah, and Abdel, would you let me know when? Sorry, go ahead, Micah. Just let me know once you guys are ready to do 2718 and I'll update the EIP 1559 with it. I've been waiting until you guys are ready. I didn't want to have okay. the EIP once again out of sync with what's actually live since I had problems before. Okay, so yeah, let's do that. Let's try and like, you know, A, finish like the proof of work, uh, proof of authority work we have right now. Uh, in parallel, I think us, you know, at the basic team, we can start looking at like just the hard fork for mainnet and what what that would look like, um, and and share that information. And so hopefully by the time that's done, we have everyone kind of agreeing on the spec on POA, and then we can we can do the fork on uh, with multiple clients on on the the mainnet. Um, and then after that, assuming everything goes smoothly, we can add the spec for twenty seven eighteen as part of it, and and we'll already have this mainnet size test net. Does that generally make sense? Yes. Um, cool. Anything else on test nets or just next steps in terms of testing? If not, uh, just last thing I think I wanted to go over is just uh, this main net readiness checklist to make sure it's still roughly up to date. Uh, based on this conversation, I'll have to change it. Um, but uh, just also useful for people tuning in. It's kind of where we keep track of, of things that needs to be done. Uh, so the client teams have been changed. I guess, never mind, you did hire somebody so we can remove this. Yeah, I cannot yet confirm in 100%, but most likely okay. yes. Most okay. Like yes. Okay, so I'll leave it up for now and uh, ping me when you want it to remove. Um, in terms of issues, DOS risks, I mean, this is kind of separate from, from this EIP itself. Uh, so I, you know, I don't think we can do much except kind of forking mainnet like we just talked about and, and that will maybe give some interesting data. Transaction encoding decoding, uh, we'll wait for 2718, but do that afterwards. Uh, replace by fee, I think is the other thing we haven't like fully sorted out. Um, and, and it's kind of related to transaction pool sorting, but like how do we actually sort transactions uh, and, and replace them in the transaction pool without creating denial of service risks. Um, I know Barnaby, uh, you, sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I think we kind of assume that we would have to prioritize uh, new format transaction because we have removed the migration period. So if we don't do that, there will be no incentive to use the new format, right? So, so the incentive to use the new format is you get a refund on your fee cap. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Mm, we should probably prioritize the transactions. So you're saying fifteen fifty nine style transactions do what in the transaction pool or in the block to get prioritized? They just, they just both. They just get prior either. Well, you don't have to if you don't. I mean, if they're prioritized in the block, that's pretty much the same thing as saying they're prioritized in the pool. Yeah, I guess it's a more, uh, it's a so, stricter prioritizing, right? Yeah. So, so well, while I agree that altru like altruistically prioritizing would be good, um, it's in a miner's interest to choose the one that's gonna pay them the most regardless of what we suggest they prioritize. And therefore clients who want miners to use their clients right. will write code that miners like, which means pays yeah, them more. I mean, I'm so I don't not, think we can I, really enforce that. I, I work with miners. I, I don't really, I don't know that I necessarily buy that narrative. Miners, uh, you know, uh, 
we you think they'll use whatever we write yes As we all so if, the, if those of us in this room agree to just write the same thing then they'll just use that same thing as your yeah. theory yeah and I, I don't really see the downside if if miners do choose to rewrite i'm not i mean i think i guess my thinking is the social consensus should be that we're all moving towards 1559 style transactions i mean that's we're kind of on this call trying to you know through this bizarre process figure out what the social consensus is so i think we should be pretty assertive in actually uh, you know we should assert yes, that these new transaction types are the preferred type and we should do that by telling the clients to sort them you know to insert them first right and if someone wants and to rewrite is, their the, the, client they can do that so there's not only miners but also the users who may not have access to the tools for some of the operations that i'll be executing so not all of the users will be able to switch quickly and it doesn't feel like there is a uh, such a requirement to and prioritize the new transactions very rapidly. So they will all work very nicely side by side. The pool works nicely side by side. We plan to prioritize based on the uh, fee paid to miners uh, as resulting from the discrepancy between the gas price, gas fee, max cap, and so on. Mm, I think it would be risky to create two different markets without, uh, because we, we removed the transition, but also if we started doing some kind of prioritizations, it will create two markets that would be competing not on the same basis and we don't have any analysis of the behavior of such market. And some users could be just removed from that market uh, just because they cannot use some tooling. So this, this how do you expect people to stop using the traditional transactions? And more and more tools will be using them. And they'll be like, if they if they 1559 is solid enough and if it saves for users the predictive predictability of the gas prices as we all uh, prove that it does via simulations then users will be uh, moving towards those better tools but in that case maybe wallet providers won't do the implementation if they, they can do they will because they compete on the market to be the best tool available on the market for the users so they will want to have their users be able to use EIP 1559 I I so um i i mean let's no i don't know that competition in the i guess philosophically <laughs> philosophically uh that seems inconsistent to me so either we are deciding what the new transaction type is or we're going to allow people to choose um I, you, I don't think we can split the difference. I feel like the, the way we've been moving is though to allow people to choose, right? Because by removing the transition period, we're basically saying, you know. Yeah, yeah so. Go ahead, yeah. I, I didn't mean to interrupt, sorry, I thought, thought I heard a break. No, 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 go, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, so just to be clear, this will, this prioritization will only come up in full blocks, right? So if our estimates are correct, like 5% of the time, we'll actually have prioritization matter. Am I correct in that? I don't think so. I, I guess the time it will come up is like right after the hard fork, right? Like there'll be, but this is not like a huge deal. Um, I mean, for like 10, for like 15 minutes, yes. Because yeah. we are expecting, like while we're ramping, you know, but then after that, the I believe the expectation is is we should not see um, really prioritization have any effect until, except for in overfill blocks, meaning more than two x demand increase. So, um, so mind. I think whichever tr route we choose probably doesn't matter too much because of that. Yeah. So my assumption is that no one is going to change. With, I mean, the incentive, as I understand it now, is that they get a there's a discount on the 1559 transactions. How big is that discount? Uh, so the I think the re reason wallets will change, uh, I actually have a blog post that I'm going to post probably tomorrow about this. Um, but I think the reason wallets will change is because it solves a major support headache for them. Um, Coinbase wallet is the kind of canonical example because they do not allow the user to set the gas price. They set it for them because they have determined that setting gas, pr gas prices is too complicated for their users. And so... The problem is, is that 
this works great, except for when there's increasing congestion, at which point Coinbase users all simultaneously suffer because all of them end up stuck as pending transactions. And those pending transactions compound these spells because the user don't know how to deal with it. And so they just send more transactions thinking, oh, that one didn't work. Let me just refresh the page and try again. And then they end up with like 15 transactions stuck. And then they need to get specialized support to help them get out of that. Um, the Coinbase wallet doesn't actually let you solve that problem yourself. You have to switch wallets <laughs> to solve it. So you have to switch over to MetaMask or just wait. And so Coinbase, for example, I strongly suspect, and I haven't talked to them, but just based on having to support their users, like they are bleeding users to MetaMask just every single time congestion happens because every support channel I'm in says to people, oh, stop using Coinbase wallet. Whereas with 1559, they can just set the, the base fee to like two or three times the current base fee and their users will basically never get pending transactions, like in, unless we have some crazy ramp up in gas prices. And so I think for wallets, that's the big sell is it solves a major user UX problem that causes heavy support load. And then I think users will just follow their wallets. That's my theory. Um, we, we, of course, can't know for sure until we see it happen. If we look at the transactions, the way they are treated, they all become EIP-1559. They just come in more efficient or less efficient uh, as the gas price is defined, either as a max fee and gas premium, which actually can give you some discount, or as a gas price, which always pays maximum potential uh, gas premium. So, so if they all EIP-1559, we are totally free to support them indefinitely after transition to EAP-1559. EAP-1559 by itself, it solves the problem whether you make everyone start using new transaction type or not. And the users will, because of how, how good it will be in simplifying their pricing mechanism and saving them some of the gas fee, they will transition to the tools with EAP-1559. So I think you're making, I agree with your argument, even though I don't think it's ontologically Look, th you're basically saying when you use users, you mean wallets. You're saying that wallets will, because if basically, if I use this other old wallet that doesn't update, my gas fees are going to be higher by using the old wallet. So the wallets will change because the users, the whole problem here is the users don't have this, like, we all know so much more about how the system works. Yes than a normal user. The users aren't going to know what's going on. All the user is going to see is that if they use wallet A, their fees are whatever percent cheaper than if they use wallet wallet B. So they're going to stop using wallet B. And so my own, and that's a perfectly fine model. But then my question is, how big is that discount? It depends. So I think the way to think about that discount is almost more in the engineer time you spend on your gas estimation algorithm, because in theory, if you got, so if you use the legacy transaction format and you estimated things just right, where like your fee cap or you, sorry, your gas price is equivalent to the base fee plus one GUI and you get that estimate just right, your discount might actually be zero, right? Like you might be able to like sneak in at the right, uh, 1559 price using your legacy transaction. But the challenge is like, that's just a hard estimation to do. Whereas under 1559, it's kind of trivial. So I feel like the discount is more like, yeah, the engineering effort you spend on your estimation algorithm, which will not be kind of perfect. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. The yeah. problem that you are solving with EIP-1559 is that people have trouble to actually calculate this perfect pricing. So exactly. yes, the, the minimum discount will be zero, but it will be never, will be never paying less with the old style transactions. Also, yeah, when, yeah. I, when I say users, I don't mean only wallets. I mean also many users that build their uh, custom tools, custom uh, algo trading tools or whatever that are actually generating transactions with the custom built solutions based on the client code. And there are probably plenty of users like this and it might be a very big cost for them to have to transition to these tools and some risk potentially. And we want to avoid that risk. So I'm, I'm talking about users in general, whoever is signing transactions, generating transactions. So by volume, do you, which group do you think represents the majority of, I, I mean, I get, so I think that that's, I understand what you're saying there. Um, I think that those are, that's a very different model for um, who the chain is for, right? If you are making millions of dollars a day, 
uh, running your ARB bots, then you can figure out how to patch your code, right? I don't, I'm not, I'm not worried about those people. Uh, you know, they're all very savvy and very uh, capable. I'm more worried about the broader base of people that are represent the larger numeric number of people, not the value on chain, right? I mean, at some point, <laughs> it's like, why are we doing this? If, if we're doing it to uh, facilitate arbitraging, then, you know, there's no point in even having this call. If we're trying to increase adoption and make more applications viable on Ethereum, then that's when these sorts of changes become important. The, the broader base of user would be the one that is using the most common tools. And the most common tools would be the ones who would be implementing EIP-1559, uh, like MetaMask or Coinbase Wallet. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's, 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 it's okay to think like this, but uh, I do see that there is an incentive for, let's say, the major wallets that the non-power users are, are using to, to shift to 1559. So I think my opinion on, on the why shift, why, why switch is, is not for the fee saving. Like I don't, I don't think Coinbase Wallet's going to add the code to save fees for their users. I don't think MetaMask is going to add the code to save fees for their users. I really do think both of them will change because it saves, it improves the UX for their users pretty significantly in certain situations. And those situations are a, a support nightmare. Um, I currently have a team running support in Uniswap, and the the number one problem that Uniswap users have, like hundreds questions every single day. Scammers are number one. Number two is my transaction is stuck pending. Like this is the support load for decentralized apps and decentralized and wallets. Like the number one question after I got scammed is. Why is my transaction pending? What is a gas fee? Why is why do I have 17 queued transactions? Like what happened? How do I fix this? Like these are all like this is where support comes costs come from. And so I think 1559 makes it so that should only happen incredibly rarely. Like when you have, you know, six blocks in a row that are all double full, which we expect to be an, an incredibly rare event. And so I'm of the opinion that the gas savings, the fee savings, is not the big deal. Like I don't, I agree with Rick that people will not switch for that gas savings because it's fairly minimal in the end. But I do think people will switch for that UX improvement. Like, and and I think that's where I disagree with Rick at least a little bit. It's just that I do think people will volunteer or wallets will voluntarily move, which will cause users to move because users will follow the wallets, um, just because the support burden is so high for for this issue. I guess. To take a step back um, about the transaction pool sorting, you know, this is not something we can enforce in consensus without major changes to the spec. Yep. I personally would be pretty opposed to doing that just because this is already a hugely complex heap and, uh, and like trying to enforce ordering in every single block feels like you're adding another. Yeah, I don't, major I don't think there's even a known, known solution to that problem right now. Yeah. So in that case, basically, you know, the transaction pool is outlet consensus. We don't necessarily have to have a solution on that now, right? Like I think it's, and, and, and it's also something we can update in like, we don't need a hard fork to update it, right? We can update it in like a, you know, bi-weekly release of Geth or Basu or whatever, if we see that there's an issue. Obviously, that's not like 100% true because, you know, miners won't have to update their notes then and, and they will at the hard fork. Um, but I guess I'm just, you know, it, it feels like kind of a pretty big rabbit hole that we might not get resolution on right now and, and we can so easily I fix. I don't, I agree we don't need to agree on it, um, but I do think there's value in making sure at least every client knows what they're going to do. Like, yeah. and yeah. so make, make sure everybody has a plan and that yeah. we kind of talk to each other and share what our plans are. So that yeah. way no one's left like having to think, solve this problem yet again while someone else has yeah. already solved it. And same thing with the replace by fee. Like everybody has to solve the replace by fee problem. They can solve it differently, but it'd be nice to at least share our potential solutions with each other. Yeah, and replace by fee, I guess, to me is a bit different because we, we talked about it on the Discord, I think it was like a month ago. And it seemed like there were a bunch of solutions that were vulnerable to potential denial of service risks. 
Um, so I think this is something where maybe, yeah, having a canonical formula that like different clients all use that we know is, is somewhat safe actually has like a, a pretty big benefit rather than the ordering of 1559 versus non-1559 transactions. And, and obviously there's overlap, right? Like the replace by fee might yeah. change how you do the, the, the ordering, but um, yeah, I, I yeah, think we, that's one where we, having a common solution is, is, is higher in priority. Yeah, I agree. We saw that recently with guests where they, their uh, yeah. semantics for transaction ordering uh, resulted in some problems because they're the dominant miner. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I know, I, I don't know if I'm remembering this right, but I feel like Barnaby, you had put together a, a formula or something for the replace by fee that was like decent. I, is that correct? Uh, yeah, yeah, it was just a way to make sure that you never can replace for free, where by for free, I mean, you can do it indefinitely, just spamming the network and you never get accountable for it. And the idea yeah. is just that you need to increase like the minimum between the minor bribe, if I remember correctly, between the minor bribe and the fee cap, like the minimum of the two has to increase with every replace by fee. Probably has to increase by like 10% or, or something like this. But, but that's the only way that you don't get into edge cases where I'm resubmitting with a different minor bribe, but it doesn't really matter anyway because I'm maxed out on my fee cap or the other way around. So yeah, it's, it's, we've discussed it a bit. I don't think it was very optimal, but it seemed that there wasn't any other option that didn't like protect you from spam, let's say. Yeah. Is there, I don't know what's like the right place to just like store that or save that so that there's like a proper discussion on it. Because yeah, I remember like Discord I messages. I'll write something. Yeah, if you could write something up, that would be that would be really valuable. And then all the client teams can kind of look at it and, and give feedback. And I think even getting like you know Peter and Martin and from guests to, to look at it could be could be really valuable. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Okay. And so yeah, I, I think yeah, for the transaction pool sorting, we can just keep the conversation going and, and share as we make progress. But it feels like there's a lot of different options and we don't necessarily need to resolve it now. Well, it just um, sounds like they don't need to be sorted at all. Right. I mean, am I missing something? I mean, basically, uh, if the if the uh, yeah, it doesn't sound like you need to do any different sorting than what's already been done because there's only one transaction type. If, effectively, if you depending on how you code it, I mean, you could like have a flag on uh, on your transactions like in memory. And then you say this one was originally a legacy transaction, so we're going to deprioritize or prioritize. So it would be possible. Um, but if you code it such that, like, when the tra legacy transaction comes in, you basically do an in memory conversion and then you drop it into a pool with everything else, uh, it, you could very easily design it such that you forgot that it was a legacy transaction originally. So I think this is, I mean, I'm sorry, I don't want to beat this dead horse, but I, I think for me, the issue is having these different code paths for something as uh, used as broadly in the Geth code base as transactions um, is a risk. Uh, but if other implementers or implementers are comfortable just you know absorbing that risk in perpetuity that you'll have two transaction types with no cutoff for when you'll support the old type, that's, um, that's fine with me. But uh, I, I just seem it just seems like it'd be better to plan that than not plan it. I think the yes. last I remember we talked about this. There was the tentative plan for deprecation, if we decide to go forward with it, was to introduce a basically legacy transaction tax. That if you submit a legacy transaction, you would be taxed a little bit, and that tax rate would increase over the span of like two years or something. The major counter argument against any kind of deprecation is people who have signed transactions from a paper wallet from three years ago that they cannot re-sign for whatever reason. Um, we want to make sure their transactions will always be valid uh, and submittable to the chain, even in 10 years. I think that's the, the main contention that I've heard is that's just a do we deprecate fine, it at all or not? Yeah, that's a perfectly fine argument. I think that, you know, I met... My experience in working with Geth, um, which is limited, 
but uh, my experience in working with Geth is that's ultimately going to be some sort of, you know, recipe for an event in the future where things go sideways. But if that's the uh, desired user experience, that's that's fine with me. Is that worth maybe I'm... just adding as like a security consideration in the EAP? Like, I don't know. Yeah, I think it's it, worth to, to I mean, that... one speaker if uh, because Rick, uh, what kind of uh, what kind of risk is suggesting that actually this um, sorting mechanism working? I mean, we still will have to define how exactly this conversion is done, right? So, because the the gas price to uh, to fee cap conversion or like to premium conversion is uh, different on different block. We were just discussing today in Netamind that uh, when you sort. Like then historically you would sort and that sorting order would be unchanged from block to block. If you start sorting by gas price, including the legacy and EP1559 transactions, then EP1559 change their gas premium based on the block by block because of the fee cap being there. So, so the sorting order may change even without new transactions arriving or, or not. Uh, so sorry, can, I'm missing something. Why would the sort order change? Like certain transactions will no longer be eligible. But oh, you cannot, you cannot determine it, the, see, the, yeah. Yeah, the actual value yeah, of a transaction it. because it depends on the block. Yeah. Yeah, the, because the you may if the fee cap if your fee cap is reached, you may end up with a lower minor bribe than mm. the previous block. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. see it. Okay. Yeah. That's unfortunate. Ugh, that sucks. Yeah, so I, I think that when we talk, I mean, maybe we should just sort of change this uh, bullet point to say, instead of transaction pool sorting, transaction pool eviction, right? If I'm understanding that is actually an issue, is that what you were just saying, uh, Tomas? Both. I mean, oh, it's, I... it's good to keep the discussion and maybe write down how everyone decided to do that, because maybe we just assume that we'll do it the same way, but we won't. So yeah. um, definitely, I agree with your comment here, Rick, that uh, it may go wrong if we at least don't describe it so everyone can read it and feel confident with it. And I think the account abstraction EAP actually did that quite well. Uh, they posted in all core devs this week and I, I was reading it, but they, as part of the EAP, they have like suggested behaviors for the transaction pool, right? And that's not obviously part of consensus, but they still specify it in the EAP and, and explain the rationale why. Um, so I think that's probably something we, We'd want to do as well. Yeah, might be there was uh, uh, there was some talk a while back, and I just realized it's not on this agenda um, about actual eviction strategies. Again, not a consensus issue technically, but there was discussion of what if we just say your transaction is evicted if the base fee goes past cool. up, like passes up your um, fee cap. Like you just flat out get evicted, need to resubmit. Um, the idea being that we can keep the tr the pending pool cleaner, like uh, thinner. The disadvantage being that it could result in more gossip if the base fee is fluctuating heavily. So we were thinking to keep even the uh, negative, negative. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to find a. Uh, the, you call it minor bribe. Okay, negative minor bribe in the pool if it's still in the top X uh, transactions. Is if you assume that the pool holds uh, four thousand transactions, and some of them towards the bottom are actually having different negative values, we still want to keep them and drop them if better transactions arrive. The, the bigger question for us was, what if we drop transactions that actually after the base fee falls would become a bit uh, more minor friendly afterwards. But we, we think that's not a very big issue, but it might be. So I would prefer to have it on paper. Yeah, there was uh, there's an argument. I, I think Vitalik made it where there was some, I'm trying to remember, if someone else remembers, please jump in. There's some potential advantage we get by evicting people, evicting transactions, um, because it solves some kind of nuisance problem that we've had in the past. Anyone remember? No. If not, I'll. Bring it up later. <laughs> it was the idea that it's actually an interesting scenario where users. Go oh, ahead. Sorry, Bernard, are you Oh, okay. Um, it was the idea that you could send your transaction with a fee that was too low, 
uh, like let's say lower than base fee currently is so that you just wait for it to be included when base fee becomes lower and i think the argument was that you shouldn't be using the network as your like transaction pending transaction queue your personal pending transaction queue all right it was basically don't uh, peers should not accept transactions with base fees that wouldn't be included in the current block like if you get if someone gossips you something and it's not can't be included you just reject it and you say yeah don't don't tell me about that please it's a waste of gossip yeah you don't have to, a softer rule to say if your transaction is 10 percent below the current base fee okay then we accept but if it's if you're just sending it in the hope that base fee gets halved at some point then we shouldn't be looking at it because it's too too much to handle yeah, I'm a fan of that. It reduces the j gossip of the network. And like you said, it keeps people from using the network as their personal storage, effectively. Yeah. Uh, I think so it would be intuitive oh, and problematic for some of the wallet users, but uh, I'm, I'm not very against it, but I think it's not necessary. That uh, we already have all the clients holding top X best transactions. and. Yeah, even with E1559, we still be able to tell which transactions are best. Um, so there is no need to specifically evict them different way. I think the idea is with 1559, the pending pool actually should be empty most of the time, right? If we evict people with base fees too low, or if we don't accept people with base fees too low. Like, so the, the whole idea of like, historically, we've always had a pending pool that's always full. We're saying that, hey, we don't have to do that anymore. We can now run clients with basically empty pending pools almost always um, because see, okay. your transaction either is included right away, like within a few blocks, or it's not going to be included at all. Like those are the two scenarios. And so we don't need to have like a, you know, 50 megabyte pending pool anymore if we, if we don't, if we decide and we don't want to gossip that stuff. Makes sense. Okay, so does it make sense to keep discussing this? Like, I, yeah, to discuss the different options in more details. I feel like personally, I just need to think through it more. Um, I, I do think there's value in discussing and at least having every client document what they do yeah. for replace by fee, what they do for eviction, what they do for accepting gossip of due transactions, and what they do for transaction pool sorting. Like, I think knowing what each of the clients do for those four is valuable, and I yeah. suspect once each client gets to implementing it, they're going to have a quite, it's going to come up as a question and they're going to ask what are other clients doing? And so I think just having that documented and talking about it is valuable. So replace eviction sorting. And what was the fourth? And gossip acceptance. Oh, gossip. Or I don't know yeah. what the word for that. Yeah. yeah. What, what do you, what does your client accept as gossip as a valid transaction? And what yeah. do you not accept as gossip? And then also this is very, actually very important. What will you kick people out of gossip for? Like if someone gossips yeah. you something that you think is just outright wrong, uh, you probably are going to blacklist them. And we want to make sure clients aren't blacklisting each other. So we need okay. to at least agree on that much. And what's the where's the best place to like actually write that down? Probably not in the EAP itself, but it feels I don't know. Does anyone have a suggestion? I agree not to EAP. Um, I can start a HackMD document. I'll link it in there. Uh, I'll, I'll link it in this in this page, and I'll just add a section for every client. Um, yeah, and then people can can uh, can uh, just add their behavior there. Um, oh, sorry, just see this in the chat. I'm not sure an informational. I wouldn't do an other EAP until we're actually like settled on some best practices. And maybe once we are settled on some best practices, we can add it out, I don't know, like some appendix to this EAP or something. But just now to like, yep. okay. Um, so testing, um, reference consensus tests, I don't think we're quite there yet, especially given that like the 2718 change still hasn't been done. Um, so this feels like it's, it's probably a bit too early. Community testing, like I think we're starting to, to do this uh, and 
you know, Abdel's tool can kind of help people interact with the network. Uh, we'll keep improving on it. And then I think the public test nets that applications can use. This is basically our fork of mainnet that we discussed earlier. So it seems like it's going well. Um, in terms of testing. 